Banking with Capital One helps you keep more money in your wallet with no fees or minimums on checking accounts and no overdraft fees. Just ask the Capital One bank guy. It's pretty much all he talks about, in a good way. He'd also tell you that this podcast is his favorite podcast, too. Oh, really? Thanks, Capital One bank guy. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One N.A. member FDIC. Hello and welcome to week two of Jets Final Drive. I'm your host, Janae Coakley, and as always, I'm joined by SNY's NFL insider, the one and only Connor Hughes. And this week, Connor, we got one of our favorite people. We got Zach Rosenblatt from The Athletic. Thanks for joining us, Zach. Of course. Happy to be here with you guys. All right, guys. Well, it wasn't pretty. In fact, that sometimes it was downright ugly, but the Jets got their first win in Tennessee yesterday, 24-17. to It was a win filled with some great plays, some really bad plays, a lot of penalties, just, you know, a week two win. So after seeing them w- lose in San Francisco week one, seeing them win in Tennessee week two, what are your thoughts on this team right now as we speak, Connor? Still the same opinion as last uh- week? Yeah, uh, I well, here's the thing. So offensively, I feel about the same as I did, Janae. We, we've reiterated this over and over and over again. I, I, I never expected the Jets' offense to look like a well-oiled machine to begin the year. I, I thought you'd see flashes of brilliance. We saw that on the 70-play touchdown drive against the San Francisco 49ers. We saw that uh, during their three touchdown drives against the Tennessee Titans. I thought they were better against Tennessee at a probably the same level caliber defense. Uh, we certainly saw them attack in different ways with Brees Hall and things like that. I know some people wanted the explosives and explosiveness down the field. Uh, that's just not how the Titans play defense. They play defense very similar to the, uh, to the Jets, where they constantly have people back deep and force you to go the length of the field if you want to put points up on the scoreboard. Uh, But you saw better aspects of the game. And I think against New England, they're going to look better than what they did uh, against the Titans. And when we go on and on and on, every single week, you'll see this offense look a little bit better. My concerns with this team, though, aside from Nathaniel Hackett, which is always going to be a concern, as we're going to reiterate all throughout this season, do, though, now center on the defense. Because... Quinn and Williams is this team's most dominant player. Sauce Gardner is probably their second best player. Jermaine Johnson fills that void as just a stabilizing force on this front. He doesn't necessarily the best pass rusher in the world. He's not necessarily the best run stuffer in the world. He's not necessarily a Nick Bosa or TJ Watt caliber player. But what he does is everything so, so well. And now the Jets are going to have to try to find a way to fill that void with no sign of Hassan Reddick coming back anytime soon and a group of undrafted guys in Tack McKinley trying to replace a guy that I don't necessarily know is replaceable. So while this offense is still trying to find its footing week in and week out, can the defense be good enough to have them beat top-tier teams? The Jets are going to be teams like the Titans that they're significantly better than, but when they play better competition like it seems like the Minnesota Vikings are now or when they play the Buffalo Bills in a couple of weeks, do they have enough without Jermaine Johnson, if the offense isn't fully caught up to speed yet to win those games. And I'm not necessarily sure that's the case. And that's my big concern after the second game. Zach, I'll let you talk now that Connor took up, you know, a good 25 minutes of the show. Mm-hmm. Zach, we got you. Can't hear you, Janae. Zach, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Oh, there we go. All right, so again, now that Connor's done talking, um, what about you? What's your thoughts now that week one and week two are completely two different teams? Are they still the same team you thought they were? Yeah, you know, I, the the hardest thing for me to grasp as someone who's not covered the Jets for that long, but the fact that we're through two games and we're not sitting here talking about how the offensive line and the quarterback are the biggest concerns we have. Right now, it's the defense is the biggest concern. Like, I... <clears throat> You know, they looked like the Jets of the last two years at the beginning of that game. They were being very conservative, not taking shots down the field, maybe even Rodgers holding on to the ball a little too long. But the difference between this team and the other teams is Rodgers. You get later in the game, and that's when he turns on the Jets. That's when he starts getting rid of the ball quickly. They start making plays down the field, and they go into that last drive, eight minutes left, and everybody on that team did not feel any stress about the idea that they could go down the field and score. 
And so for those reasons, I'm I'm very optimistic on this offense, maybe even more than I thought I would be at the start of the season. You have a guy in Braylon Allen who's kind of emerging now as a re- legit weapon. Garrett Wilson's there. Brees Hall is doing his thing. The offensive line is doing their thing. Um, so I come out of that game offensively being very optimistic about this team's ability to take the next step and become an explosive offense and score some points as they get used to playing with each other. The defense, you know, I, I, I have a lot of concerns about how they're going to get pressure up front without Jermaine Johnson. Um, you know, they don't really have a great rotation of guys now at defensive end, and that's a huge part of this defense over the last few years. So I'm very curious to see how that plays out. But as long as they can keep it close every week, then they're going to have a chance because they have Aaron Rodgers, and in the fourth quarter, he's going to turn it on, even if he's 40 years old coming off an Achilles. And, and Zach hit the, hit the nail on the head. Just real quick, to, I mean, the, it's talent. Like, that, that's what we haven't seen from the Jets in so, so, so long. I mean, they were put in positions with Mike LaFleur and with Adam Gase before that and with, with uh, uh, Jeremy Bates before that and, and, and all these guys. Like, they, they never had a roster that was capable of stepping foot on the field offensively and you being able to say, we are better than you at 10 of 11 positions, if not more. And a lot of times that's the case now for the Jets. They have weapons everywhere they have a well above average offensive line that's continuing to gel by the way morgan moses tyron smith they've been able to stay healthy with what the jets are doing with them aaron Rodgers is going to continue to get more comfortable as he knocks the rust off you're going to see mike williams working more you're going to see garrett wilson get more active when he doesn't have sneed on him this team you can't keep them down for four quarters eventually they are going to get into the end zone and what's wild is like i was reading some criticisms i covered the giants game last week. i was reading some criticisms of the jets offense do we realize that they went up against the San Francisco 49ers in week one, one of the best defenses in the NFL? They went up against the Tennessee Titans in week two, one of the best defenses in the NFL. They scored three touchdowns in both of those games. Like, when, when was the last time that we saw a Jets team capable of doing this? Like, they, there, were, there were months and, and that we didn't feel like they put up points like this. So it's going to get better. They still have to gel. It was never going to be well over Michelle early on. And, and what if you want to hang your hat on it, it's with Zach Hitt. They have the talent now to compete against anyone offensively, and that's going to take them a long way this year. And that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, it's crazy to talk about it. We're talking about the defense having some problems, no concern really about the offense. And a big piece that, let's talk about Braylon Allen. He had two touchdowns yesterday. He's 20 years old, the youngest guy in the NFL to do that. I mean, do we now have, do the Jets now have, a 1A and a 1B with Brees Hall and Braylon Allen, or is it still Brees is the number one and Braylon's the number two? What do you think, Zach? You know, I, as someone who's covered a decent amount of training camps, Connor, too, you kind of feel vindicated when a guy who is very good in training camp translates to the season because a lot of times you're wrong about guys um, when they're playing against their teammates every day. And Braylon looks like the guy we saw all summer. And so to your question, like, I think – earlier in the season than I expected because the Jets usually take their time with the young players. I think he's earned a role. He looks like one of their three or four most impactful offensive players right now as Mike Williams gets into the groove of things. And they're going to they're gonna find ways to get creative with them. You know, they put them both on the field at the same time, which is something they never really did the last few years. I think they wanted to do that with Dalvin Cook. It never happened. And so you have a guy in Braylon Allen who's a strong runner, much better in the passing game than anybody expected. And they're going to have a hard time keeping him off the field. And that's not a bad thing. Now you can give Brees Hall a breather. And at the end of the season, if they're both healthy, then you have two legitimate number one running backs playing at the same time. Brees is always going to be the bell cow. They're going to give him the ball, you know, 20 times a game, however many. But you can get if you can get Braylon Allen five to 10 touches every week, I think you feel pretty good on offense. You know, Janae, the the first two years of of Brees Hall's career when, when he was on the field, when he came off it, there was no threat. You could just focus on Garrett Wilson. You could focus on whoever. You could pressure the quarterback because you knew that there was no other running back, not Dalvin Cook, not Michael Carter, that was capable of making a play. There was a significant and substantial drop-off from Brees Hall to everyone else, and everyone knew the Jets wanted to feature Brees Hall, and then when he came off the field, it was like, well, okay, we don't have to worry about that anymore. It's to the point now where all eyes are still going to be on number 20 because he is an all-pro caliber player. 
But what you now have in Allen is a player you have to worry about as well. And when Brees Hall needs a breather, you don't have to give him the ball 40 times a game, even though I know he'd love it. You can give him at 20, keep him fresh throughout the course of the season, and know the snaps that he's not on the field, you're not going to have any bit of a drop-off. But what Zach touched upon, which is something that I did absolutely love, and if anything, it made me say, okay, Nathaniel Hackett, you're starting to piece this thing together. It was the first touchdown that Braylon Allen scored, because what the Jets did was they took Brace Hall, who everyone's going to have their eyes on, and they shot him out right, they pump faked him, and then they came over to Braylon Allen, who made a play and got into the end zone for a touchdown. As soon as, they, as, soon as Aaron Rodgers looked towards Hall, all eyes went towards Hall. And then he was able to come back and give it to Allen, who went into the end zone. But it's not like they're just giving the ball to someone else. They're giving the ball to a player that can play. And this is something that we have seen from this guy. Zach said training camp. I go all the way back to OTAs when he stepped on the field, when Brees Hall wasn't working because the Jets were still working him, working him back from some off-season stuff that he was working through with some minor injuries. Brees, Br- Braylon Allen got rep after rep after rep. Not Izzy Abataconda, who was there last year. Uh, it was Allen. And there were so many times in OTAs and then in minicamp where you just turned your head and said, guy looks like he can play a little bit. That guy looks like he can play a little bit. Whether it was catches, whether it was runs, you were just consistently seeing this guy flash. Constantly. And then it continued to training camp. It continued into the preseason with those two physical runs he had in the opener. And now we're seeing it into the regular season. And it is such another weapon because what the Jets want to do is be led by their ground game. I know Garrett Wilson. I know Mike Williams working his way back. I know Aaron Rodgers. But they want to be a team that imposes their will on the ground, brings those safeties into the box because you have to stop Hall. Now you have to stop Allen. And then they can attack deep. We haven't seen that before because it was always one player you had to key on. Now when you have two, it's just waves. We talk about the Jets' defensive line, right? Waves of pass rusher, waves of pass rushers. The Jets now have it with a run game where you get tired chasing around Brees Hall. You get a little worn down. You're trying to catch your breath. Now you have the big big physical back and Allen come down to break you apart. It reminds me a little bit back when the Giants were good way, way long ago, and they had the combination of Ahmad Bradshaw and Brandon Jacobs. Brandon Jacobs would just bully you and beat you down for two or three quarters. Then they'd bring in Ahmad Bradshaw, and he would be shifty and run all around. The Jets kind of have the reverse of it, where you're getting tired of chasing a guy down, and now you got to deal with the big physical presence of Allen. It's a tremendous situation for this offense to be in, and we're just seeing it in its infancy stages. It's only going to get better and better as the season goes on. And it's crazy because he's only 20 years old. I mean, yeah. this guy plays as if he's been playing forever, and then you get him in front of that line. I think he made the comment, like, my Nana could run through that. Yeah. I mean, you add that with the line, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy what these two, the, th- the killer bees, can do. And it's a good defense, Janae. Like, that's the thing, is, is what people are for- – like, I, I don't want people to lose track of this because Will Levis is terrible. And, and, and that, that was always going to be something where it was like, oh, look how bad Levis is. The Jets lost this game because of Levis, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, he had the turnover in the red zone. The interception in the very next possession, it, holding the ball too long, which allowed the Will McDonald sack. Like, it, 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 Will Levis was always going to do things that were going to give the Jets a couple extra possessions. But this Titans defense is one of the five best in the entire NFL. The five best in the entire NFL. These were the games the last two or three years that the Jets scored six points and were run out of the building and were a laughing stock. And they still were able to establish a semblance of a run game, hit some big plays. With the, again, so many new pieces on this offense who are only going to gel more and more as the year goes on. I, I think the fact that not only are we talking about these promising players, we're not talking about these promising players doing it against a defense that stinks. They're doing it against one of the better and premier units in the league. We're now, now we're going up against a team, and the, the, the Jets are going to be going up against a team in the Patriots next week, where you can turn around and say, this week, wait a minute, that defense isn't that good. Like, what are they going to be able to do to them? And then when the schedule lightens up, it should get a little bit, little bit better. All right, let's talk about the Jets defense, because again, crazy that we're actually not that many concerns about the offense, more concerns about the defense. Let's talk about Jermaine Johnson, because it was heartbreaking to see a guy like Jermaine Johnson, who's worked so hard, you know, he's out for the year with the torn Achilles. And Zach and I we were both at the game. We talked about this. He talked in the locker room last night. And you don't see guys after injuries like that talk after a major injury. And it was really cool for him to do it. But he says, you know, I'll be back. So, guys, does that mean that the Jets need to work out a deal with Hassan Reddick? Zach, I'll let you talk because Connor likes to talk for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I... If you if Hassan Reddick didn't have leverage before, he certainly does now. You know, this 
this defense this defense is predicated on the defensive line winning up front. They don't blitz. They don't do exotic things. It's just the defensive linemen go one on one and they win their matchups. And when you take away Jermaine Johnson and you don't have Bryce Huff and John Franklin Myers in there, I don't have a lot of confidence in this group winning their matchups consistently. Will McDonald had a great game. He had three sacks. The last one was the best one. He won with power. Robert Sala has been asking for that all offseason. But he's not been a full-time starter. He has not had other teams preparing for him all week. Michael Clemens has not shown much as a pass rusher. Tack McKinley is a journeyman, and you have a couple of undrafted rookies. And so you look at that defense, and they need pass rush to succeed. And so they, the unique thing about this losing a key player like Jermaine is that you have the guy that can fix it on the roster. He just hasn't shown up since his introductory press conference. So – if they were ever going to make this work with Hassan Reddick, they're going to have to make the call. Joe Douglas is going to have to call him and give him some money. I don't know how much he wants or how much he needs in order for him to be willing to show up. We don't know what kind of shape he's in even, but over the last four years, he has the fourth most sacks in the NFL. He's one of the best pass rushers in the NFL, and he's a guy that can make a huge impact. Maybe he's not going to help in the run game, but he is a significant upgrade over what they have, and then it allows them to do a lot of other things on the defense. So. Whether he's willing to come to the Jets at all, maybe he's not at this point. Even if Joe Douglas were to call him, it's a real possibility. You never see him in a Jets uniform. But Joe Douglas needs to make the call, and they need to see what they can do to try and convince him to come because I wouldn't say their season depends on it, but it like kind of does a little bit. Did we see glimpses, O'Connor, with Will McDonald? Can he kind of fill somewhat of a void? It's, it's tough because I, I think, honestly, Janae, and we talked a little bit about this in, in the open, is that I don't, I don't look – at Jermaine Johnson and and just see pass rusher, you know, like if you if you compare this situation to the Jets last year and and say they lost Bryce Huff, it's like okay, well he's a pure pass rusher. They just need another pure pass rusher. Boom, you you throw and then you throw Will McDonald up and Will McDonald can take those snaps from him. Or if they had lost John Franklin Myers, he's kind of like that run stuffing defensive end. It's like okay, well Michael Clemens can can kind of fill in and, and do that role for them. Jermaine Johnson was the one player in this defensive line that did everything like, like he's not just a pass rusher yes he rushes the passer well but he's also the run stuffer he's the one player that Aaron Whitecott and Jeff Ulbrich could hang their hat on and say like this guy is just going to be a stabilizing force on the outside so if the Jets go out there and and they were able to bring in Hassan Reddick it's going to be a major infusion of talent into their pass rushing department but how does it help the run game you know like I, it's 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 such a brutal blow and the first true test of adversity because there's not one player that's going to fix everything there's so much that johnson does well and so much that he was asked to do for this team even just that side think about the the the, the defensive ends anyway you feel maybe not so confident with with uh michael clemens as an edge setting force now suddenly you're going to feel not so confident either side i know will mcdonald's going to certainly play a ton more you're going to see mcgregor Fill in as well, probably when the Jets need a little bit more bulk on the outside for Jermaine Johnson. But the first part's going to get an infusion of snaps is Will McDonald. I just worry that, yeah, Hassan Reddick would help the pass rush, but I don't necessarily know if he replaces Jermaine Johnson because, truthfully, I don't think there is a replacement on this roster because there isn't a complete defensive end on the roster. Hassan Reddick, he was a player. One of the reasons why the Eagles wanted to move on was because they felt he sold out for sacks last year for them the last couple of years that's all he did he was the ocu manure running around the outside just to make sure he could get his 10 sacks a year that's great when you also have players that can stop the run but now what are the jets going to do have a, a pass rusher in will mcdonald who can't necessarily play the run and then a pass rusher in Hassan reddick who can't really play the run and then michael clemens who i don't necessarily know how much this team trusts i mean this is a brutal brutal blow for a team uh and reddick would would help things i don't know if zach you, you could talk about this too I don't know if, if this is going to soften any stance because I don't know where the money is coming from to pay him. I mean, there has yeah. to be someone willing to write that check, and I don't know if the Jets are willing to write that check right now until he shows up. Uh, but it would be the first step probably is bring him in and then figure it out. But I don't know if it necessarily fixes it. Banking with Capital One helps you keep more money in your wallet with no fees or minimums on checking accounts and no overdraft fees. Just ask the Capital One bank guy. It's pretty much all he talks about in a good way. He'd also tell you that this podcast is his favorite podcast, too. Oh, really? Thanks, Capital One Bank guy. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One N.A. member FDIC. All right, let's talk about possibly maybe fixing the offensive play calling a little bit. It seemed by the end of the game yesterday that Nathaniel Hackett and Aaron Rodgers getting a little more creative. Do you think that was just a matter of 
Aaron and Nathaniel getting back on the same page, the chemistry coming back together. Did you see something that caused this change, or was it just them getting more comfortable with each other? They, they um, connected on some big Well, I was going to let Zach together. talk because, Connor, you just like to talk a lot. Go, yeah. Zach. Sorry. I got yeah, you, Zach. Don't worry. I was going to say, I found it found it funny that after the game, Aaron Rodgers went out of his way to share an anecdote about how this week he went up to Nathaniel Hackett and said, you know, we should do that play where we have both the running backs in at the same time. And Nathaniel Hackett's like, oh, I don't know if this is the right week for that. And then Aaron Rodgers convinced him otherwise. They go out and do it. They, they have that amazing touchdown where he fakes it to Brees Hall and then he throws it to Braylon Allen and he runs for the score. And then he points Nathaniel Hackett on the sideline as if to say, like, told you so kind of thing. So <laughs> I think there's still balancing out, like, what Aaron wants to do, what Hackett wants to do. I do still have some concerns about how conservative they've been at the beginning of the games. It was a problem pretty much every week last season where they're coming out, they're run, run, pass, or basically run, short pass, pass. And it's just not – everybody kind of knows what they're going to do half the time. And so – Having Braylon Allen as another weapon, I think, adds another wrinkle into the offense. It allows them to get a little more creative. And if Mike Williams gets a little healthier, then you have kind of four quadrants of of offensive players that you can do a lot of things with. We still need to see it from Hackett. Having Rodgers out there to be able to change things at the line is the biggest difference, obviously. You didn't have that with Zach Wilson or Tim Boyle or you know all these guys the last couple of years. So um, I am encouraged by the way that the game ended, but you'd want them to come out being a little more aggressive at the beginning of the games. That's where my biggest concern still lies with Nathaniel Hackett. Yeah, and, and, and what's promising for me is, is just that you did see, it was, it was, again, comparable defenses, better in week two than week one. I, I think that's, that's safe to say. I mean, yeah, we, we can get angry at, at the run-run pass at times and, and the boring play calling and, and things like that, but this is also a really good defense that made it their goal to take away the stuff over the top. So if you're taking away the stuff over top and then you miss some things underneath, it, it thwarts drives, you know? So uh, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see how this team looks this coming week against the Patriots. This, to me, is that major measuring stick because this is the first time that the Jets' offense is substantially better than their competition. And they should have a coaching advantage, too. I genuinely do believe that. And if that's the case, this should be now three weeks into the season. You've had camp. You've had OTAs. All but one player had minicamp. This should be the point where that rust is gone now and you really start to see a complete game plan. If we're still seeing the boringness and then some heroics need to happen at the end for Rodgers to save the game and all that, I'm probably going to be a little bit more concerned. But the one thing I can, if you, if you want positivity, the positivity is that it was better in week two than week one against comparable competition. And now the schedule lightens up a little bit. Do you guys think that they need to involve Garrett Wilson more? And then what about Tyler Conklin and some of these tight ends here? I mean... Do you think that needs to be a force, a weapon do? Yeah, Conklin in particular, that his lack of involvement has been a little confusing to me. But, you know, the first week they didn't have many plays, so that was a big reason for that. Yeah. He still didn't really get involved very much this week. I think he's a can be a really uh, impactful part of that offense. The Garrett part of things, you know, they had LeJerry Sneed following him. He's going to have the top cornerback following him every week. You do want him to get more targets. This is one of the best receivers in the NFL. And he made some plays that were pretty ridiculous yesterday even in a small sample size. Same thing know, with week right? one. So, um, Aaron Rodgers even said like he had 11 targets in week one. He's like, that still didn't feel like enough. So they know they need to get him the ball. It would help if you have other receivers. Like the running backs have been great. You need the other receivers to kind of take some attention away. Yeah, you need Mike Williams, Alan Lazard, Xavier Gibson, Malachi Corley. All these guys need to take some attention away from Garrett. Because so far, nobody's really scared the defense so far outside of him. What about you, Connor? You, you can't... Uh... Yeah, Garrett, Garrett Wilson's the – look, I, I, this weekend I covered the Giants, and, and they lost to the Commanders, but Brian Dable threw to Malik Neighbors 18 times. Like, Malik Neighbors and Garrett Wilson are comparable players. Like, that's that dynamic, dominant of a player. When you have a dynamic, dominant player like Garrett Wilson, you want to just force-feed him the ball because, you know, even if you only complete 10 of the 18, those 10 are going to be significantly better than forcing the ball to Alan Lazard or dumping it off in the flat to this guy or all that other stuff. But you do want to play smart – and within the offense. You don't want to just get reckless with it. You don't want to just start throwing things up. And like Zach said, Sneed being on him played a big role. That's one of the five, ten most dominant cornerbacks in the entire NFL. It was going to be tough sledding. So Rodgers said, okay, you want to take away my one, let's start looking at two, three, four, five. The concerning one is exactly what Zach said. It's Tyler Conklin. This is a guy who set career highs in receptions and yards last year. No touchdowns, but that's because of the Jets and F quarterback play. He's somebody that when you are focusing on the outside, when you want to focus on, on Brees Hall, Feature him. And I don't mean feature him, Janae, as, as, a, as a third option. 
I believe he can be the guy that is the number one or number two read in progressions, and I don't think that's been the case. It's kind of been like, all right, also maybe find Conklin in the corner. No, work him down the seam. That's what we saw in camp. Work him in the flat. That's what we saw in the camp. Outs, ins. I mean, he's a very talented forceful player. I believe he's somebody that can be a top 10 to top 15 tight end in the league. I think he's that talented. The Jets just aren't using him. And it's almost like they have all these new toys. They've got Garrett Wilson, who they know about. Mike Williams, they want to work. They want to feature Brees Hall and get him going. They love Braylon Allen. You're forgetting about what you have. And what you have in, in Tyler Conklin is a very reliable, very talented, useful offensive weapon that they're not using right now. And, and it's, it's almost like they got tunnel vision instead of seeing the whole field and saying, okay, why don't we use him to open everything up? Because now if you've got to worry about the seam with Conklin, and you go to, it's just, it makes it so much easier for this offense and Aaron Rodgers to operate. All right, let's move on to the AFC East, considering the Jets are playing their first AFC East uh, uh, opponent on Thursday. But we're going to talk about the Dolphins and the Bills because Thursday night we saw Tua Tungavaloa leave the game in the third quarter after another scary concussion. Now, Connor, I know you were very high on the Bills in the preseason, but not many expected them to run through the Dolphins like they did on Thursday. So is the AFC East the Bills to lose right now in week two? Yeah, not many people expected. that. I didn't expect that. I lost a, I, that was, that was one of my bets. I lost that one. I, I, kind of figured the, uh, I thought the Dolphins were going to win that one. They're, they're the September Miami Dolphins. They're a track team. I thought they'd get up on the Bills defense. That's a bit undermanned. Uh, but no, what, what, what I kind of forgot is that Josh Allen is spectacular. And I know that he struggles against Robert Sala's defense, but he's playing so free right now. And, and I don't know if two is going to return this year. I, I know reports came out that he's going to play again uh, in his career, but he's dealing with something that is so significant that you need to think about long term. And yeah. even in the short term with the Miami Dolphins, they almost lost to the Jaguars in the opener. In fact, if NTN didn't fumble going in the end zone, they're staring 0-2, one very bad loss to Jacksonville, and then getting smoked by the Bills in Week 2. I mean, that's that's not good for a Miami team that, that certainly has some questions about their ability to finish uh, and not just beat teams that they're more talented than that they can run around. So, uh, yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, because, you know, when teams are so good for so long, Janae, you kind of forget how good they actually are. And the Bills have been so good for so long, really since Josh Allen's third year in the league, that we've kind of forgot, like, oh, yeah, that's a good team. They're very well offensive coach. They're very well defensive coach. They have very good players on that roster. Aside from now, maybe they're decimated a little bit, having lost their receivers in the offseason. But they still have an MVP caliber quarterback who's now playing freer than ever before. So, yeah, they've never won the big one yet, but they're still pretty damn good. And, and I do believe that without Tua, uh, undeniably the Bills are the favorite right now in the, in the AFC East. And, and I think that we're going to learn a lot when the Jets play the Bills in a few weeks. We're going to learn a lot after that game. Tag. Yeah, you know, I, I think to Connor's point, I think people saw all the players the Bills lost this offseason. I think they forgot the most important factor is they have the best quarterback in the division. Josh Allen remains one of the two or three best quarterbacks. And it felt like this was a recipe for him to have an MVP year because everybody's doubting. Everybody's looking at his receivers saying, OK, he lost to Fon Diggs. He lost Gabe Davis. They have nobody left. They got rid of all these defensive guys. And so he's leading this offense still anyway. And they're they've been spectacular. And on the other side, you have Sean McDermott, who you know, he's gotten a lot of flack but over the years, but he's time and time again proven to be a really good defensive coach. He gets his guys ready to go every week, and that defense is always one of the best in the NFL. And so, you know, the Bills are, regardless of all the players they lost, they're the team to beat until the, anybody proves them otherwise. The Dolphins had a lot of weird energy this offseason. I thought they also lost a lot of guys. Tua before his concussion did not look very good that game. That was kind of the, the storyline until he had his concussion, which was very scary, obviously, but he was not looking very good. And so... They have quarterback issues now, and they don't have a lot of depth across their roster. The Jets obviously have some questions in how they can survive the season health-wise and stuff on their defense. And, you know, the Patriots are a rebuilding team. So it, it absolutely is the Bills' division to roll with. And as Connor said, like, we're really going to find out what the Jets are made of when they go against the Bills. They've played pretty well against them over the last couple of years. But this is kind of going to be a real test of, like, all right, you want to be taken seriously as a contender – show what you can do against the Buffalo Bills. And so that's going to be a game on the schedule that I think is going to be the real first real big test since the 49ers game, I guess, at that point. All right, guys. I think, I don't know, that's the week after London, right? When they play the Bills Monday night? Yeah. But they got Thursday night first you get through. All right, guys, before we wrap the, this episode <laughs> of Get's Final Drive, we have Game Ball's Rapid Fire. All right, you got to give the guy you're going to give your game ball to from yesterday's game. Zach, we'll start with you. Yeah, I'm going Braylon Allen. I won't, we hit on a lot of the points already, but the, the offense really started to open up once he got out there. 
that's when they went from being a little boring to being a little creative and he really changed thing. And he changes kind of the ceiling in this offense. If he can be what he did that, what he, if he can do what he did that week. Connor. Yeah. Janae, I'm going with Mike Williams. It was just the one catch that 16 yarder on second and 16, but I don't think the jets win this game. If he doesn't bring that in, I mean, the jets brought him in to be the 50, 50, go get the ball, physical presence, dynamic force, take some pressure away from Garrett Wilson. He's still working his way back. He's still on a pitch count, but you got that glimpse of what he can bring to an offense. And there were some concerns on whether he could physically still do it. That answered him for me. As long as he is on the field, he is a dynamic presence, and he's going to be a force. And I don't see the Jets winning this game. I know Braylon Allen was spectacular. The defense made plays when they had to. All that stuff. Aaron Rodgers, the two-minute drive. But that catch did it because they're not going to convert third and 16. And I kind of felt like the Titans were probably going down and kicking a game-winning field goal, if not. I can't hear Connor. So I'm just, can you hear him, Zach? Yeah, I can't hear either of you right now. Okay, I can't hear anybody right now. So anyways, I was going to say I'm going to give the game ball to the person who muted uh, Connor's mic, but I guess they muted my mic. I don't know, but you guys can still hear me. All right, for now, thank you all for joining us on this episode of Jets Final Drive. For Connor Hughes and Zach Rosenblatt, hey, thanks so much for joining us, Zach. That was a lot of fun. Again, I can't hear you, so don't even talk back. Um, I'm Janae Coakley. We will see you all on Friday following the Jets' home opener against the Patriots on Thursday night football. Going to be fun. Bye, guys. One, two, three, four. Those are numbers, but you already knew that. If you want to know what number you're going to pay each month for your car, use Kelly Blue Book My Wallet on AutoTrader. They're really good at numbers. AutoTrader.